Hello everyone, my name is Mark Worrell um, and with me is Christian. Hello. Um, we're going to talk to you today about privacy and AI safety. It's going to be a tech talk, um, but we're going to keep it um, heavy on intuition examples as well. Um, brief agenda, so introduction to speakers, we've kind of covered that. Um, we're going to introduce faculty briefly and AI safety and how we think about it. And then Christian will talk about private synthetic data. Um, I will talk about creating private synthetic data via differential privacy. And then Christian will talk through some real world examples um, of how we've deployed this in the real world. If you have questions um, throughout the presentation, please use a question answer facility on Zoom. Um, and we'll try and run through as many of them as we can at the end. So we're aiming to present for around 40 to 45 minutes and then take as many question answers at the end as we can. Uh, so as I've said, I'm Mark and I'm presenting with Christian. We're both data scientists at faculty and faculty exists to make AI real. We've done this um, through many data science projects um, with many companies across a range of countries and sectors. And you can see there on the screen uh, some of the companies that we've worked with to achieve this goal. So I'm going to give a quick, give a quick introduction to AI safety now. And this um, has been a focus of our research and development team for several years now, essentially because we believe that to make AI real, it has to be safe. It's a fundamental prerequisite in our eyes. When people often think about risks associated with um, AI, if we kind of zoom out and think of broader risks, they can be pretty unstructured and cover many things. So things like killer robots, which may be the thing of science fiction or significant um, really longer time horizons, um, to things that are with us today, such as deep fakes. Faculty, we kind of loosely place these um, risks into um, a grid here. You can see on the x-axis intention and then on the y-axis like the autonomy level, um, which roughly correlates with the time horizon. This is just a loose framework in how to structure some of those risks and thinking around it. As a company, when we um, think about um, AI safety, we break it into four, four pillars. The first of these is explainable, and that means like roughly intuitively what you think it means, like, you know, can we demystify the black box to some extent and explain outputs and decisions made by the model? Fairness is more complicated to, de to define and can vary with societal norms or with um, jurisdiction. At faculty, we've got research which can essentially make um, models fair conforming to any of those definitions. Robustness as data scientists is something that we think about in terms of generalization, but also can be estimating uncertainty from the model, um, even down to things like, um, am I robust to adversarial attacks? Privacy, which is a focus of this talk, um, again, can be hard to define. We're going to do that later formally um, per one definition but also can just loosely be thought of as, you know, can we extract sensitive information from this data set or are individuals who are part of our training data compromised in some manner? So with that brief overview um, out of the way, I'm gonna hand over now to Christian, who's gonna introduce you to um, private synthetic data. Right, um, just to quickly say, we now have 57 participants in the call. So I think this could well be the pinnacle of my career. Um, okay, private synthetic data. Uh, next slide, please. So why does data privacy matter? So many of you are aware that in real world data sets, we quite often have the situation where we have sensitive information in there. And the prime example of this is, for example, in the healthcare sector. So we have loads of data sets where we have patient data and that's sensitive information that shouldn't be released. And just to really be explicit about this, why shouldn't it be released? Well, if this sort of data falls into the wrong hands, it can have malign consequences for the individuals in the data. So for a healthcare data set, the classic example is if your insurance companies know that you have a particular disease, they might um, have higher premiums for your insurance. So what this means in practice is that we really have to make sure that access to those data sets is strictly regulated. And that unfortunately has as a byproduct this it creates this barrier for any deployment of AI. So the question is then, how do we still make use of this valuable data 
while also simultaneously protecting the privacy of the ind individuals inside the data. Next slide, please. Right, so just to start with a really simple example, I will show you why data anonymization by itself does not actually guarantee privacy. So this is a really important point um, that uh, is sort of like the starting point in terms of why do you actually need synthetic data. So imagine we have this small data set as I show it here. So this could be thought of as medical appointments. And as you can see, we have appointment numbers, we have some names, we have times, and we have a, like a GP practice as well. So if you wanted to anonymize this data set, what you could do is you could get rid of the column that has the name field. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so we do that, we get rid of this column, and the question is, does this data set now protect the privacy of the people inside it? Next slide, please. I'm gonna argue that is not the case, and I'm gonna show you how this could not be the case. So imagine now, in addition to this first data set, we also had some auxiliary data. So this could be, for example, um, data from transport. So here I mocked up an example where we have uh, a tube station data set where we show different people exiting a tube station that's nearby the practice. And as you can see in this case, we find that the name B.C. exits the tube station at very similar times to their appointment status, appointment time. So this means if we were to have access to this data set, we could to some extent reconstruct the sensitive field in the original data set. Next slide, please. So this means if you just remove a single column from a data set, it remains liable to re-identification. So it's a really important point that just removing sensitive information from data does not guarantee privacy. Another example of thinking about this is imagine each row in your data set is like a fingerprint. And even if I remove parts of that fingerprint, you still have quite a lot of information in there. So you could in theory figure out um, who the row belongs to. Cool, next slide, please. Yeah, and just to say, this is not just a contrived example that I dreamed of. This has actually happened. And we have a few real world examples here that you can look up. The most famous one is probably the Netflix price where people are sort of given this open data set of Netflix movie recommendations and then, which was supposed to be anonymized, but then researchers found they could actually re-identify this using another data set. Cool, uh, next slide please. So now I'm gonna talk about synthetic data and why this offers help in this sort of situation. So let's define synthetic data first. Um, imagine we have some real data here on the left, and this looks like some census data where we have names, ages, and occupations. And now imagine we have some sort of mechanism that makes synthetic data. Next slide, please. So here we have some private synthetic data. And as you can see, um, we have sort of similar information in there. We have the same columns, we have similar fields in there. And um, if you go to the next slide, what's important here is that even though like all the data, all the rows in the data are different, what the private synthetic data does, it is still is sufficiently like the real data in many aspects. So it manages to capture like key statistical properties, for example, the mean age. So if you were to compute the mean age in this left-hand and right-hand data set, you will find they come out the same. Quick footnote here, when we did this in rehearsal, I actually managed to get those numbers wrong, but I'm pretty sure they're now correct. So if they're not, you know, let me know. Cool, uh, sure. next slide. So privacy, how does this guarantee privacy? So Mark will formalize this later on a bit better in terms of mathematical terms, but essentially what happens here is that when we generated the synthetic data, we didn't really have any dependence on a single row in the data, but instead it was all about sort of extracting statistical properties that sort of remain constant without having a, a single row included or excluded. So based on that, we make the synthetic data. So it's not dependent on like an individual in the data, it just captures aggregate properties. Next slide, please. Yes, and finally, 
always we have to remember with synthetic data is if you really want to know how useful is my synthetic data, you always have to think of a specific task in mind. So utility always needs to be assessed with a specific task. In this example, we saw that the mean age comes out the same, if I fudged it correctly. But if we were to find like the fraction of data scientists in this example, we find that in the real data, we have two thirds, but in the synthetic data, only one third. So we have this synthetic data set would be great for computing the mean age, but not so good for finding the fraction of data scientists in the population. And I think that's all from me. And now we head over back to Mark, who will go through the glorious mathematical details. Thank you, Christian. Um, so I'm going to walk through now um, an introduction to differential privacy, um, which is a framework um, which we're going to apply here to give us the guarantees that we require. I should know that every time I've given this presentation so far, I always seem to mess something up. So I'll try and catch myself if I do that today. So Christian's already alluded to this fact that traditional methods like anonymization or aggregation um, don't protect privacy. And we can kind of think of this loosely as this fundamental law of information recovery, which is that overly accurate answers to too many questions destroy privacy. And intuitively that makes sense to us. We always have um, some friends who when we ask them a question answer precisely, and we can easily extract the information which we require from them. Uh, and other people who either on purpose or not just answer imprecisely to things and it takes as many more queries to get the information that we require if we get it at all. And some of these attacks um, can be applied to machine learning models that are trained on data. We can actually work out if we have access to that model to query via an API to look at its outputs or if we have access to the model um, weights or parameters itself. We can actually like um, find out sensitive information from people from the training data. Some of these attacks are sophisticated and they do require significant effort. Um, but regardless, if you're not using a formal framework, you have no guarantees of privacy. And this is precisely what differential privacy will give us. It will give us a mathematical framework to think about privacy alongside precise guarantees. So we talked about privacy being a concern for models and not just for data. And we can loosely think of this trade-off in terms of privacy and utility. Uh, on the y-axis, we have privacy here from bottom to top. We have no privacy to uh, maximum privacy. And on the x-axis, um, we have no utility um, of our data. If we move to the right, we have maximum utility. Um, so there is a trade-off between um, how private we want to be and how much utility we want to retain. And if we think of starting in the right bottom corner of this chart, which is where we have maximum data utility and we've done no privacy procedures, uh, that's where we usually, um, usually are. And if we move up the um, privacy plane, then we give up some data utility. Obviously, we'd love to be in situation one with maximum pr um, privacy and maximum utility, but typically there'll be some trade-off and we're gonna be able to quantify that trade-off and find an acceptable trade-off for our use case. And that will vary per our use case. In some realms, it's obviously much more important to keep data private than in others. So just to step back for a second before we jump into the technical details um, and to think about how we should think about privacy. Given we want to re respect the privacy of individuals in our data, a first thought might be that we shouldn't be allowed to learn specific things about people within our data. But that turns out to not be quite right. And we can illustrate this with an example. Let's say we have a friend, um, Bob, who smokes, and um, we then find out via the internet through some scientific study that there's a link between smoking and cancer. Um, so two questions arise from this. First, like, you know, has Bob been harmed by this um, scientific study? Possibly. If his insurance company knows he smokes as well and they see this study, they may put his premiums up which isn't good for Bob, um, but has his privacy been compromised? Differential privacy will say no, with the rationale that the impact on the smoker, Bob, is the same independent of whether they were part of the study or not. It's the conclusions of the study which have harmed him, not his presence in the data set or not. With this in mind, it's 
like th saying that we can reach the same conclusions from any analysis independent of whether we take an individual and replace them with another random member of the population. So we're allowed to learn facts about the world. We're just not allowed to learn something about an individual that we can't learn without them. That's what that top bullet point is saying. And that's like the key strap line for differential privacy. And we're going to see later how that's aligned with um, in machine learning, like preventing overfitting and is actually um, will help us generalize. So in this sense, differential privacy doesn't save you from harm. It saves you from any additional harm that can arise from being a member of a data set. Um, to do this, we've already alluded to the fact that we may have to be slightly less accurate in our responses. And we can illustrate this by the randomiz a randomization procedure um, and coin flipping. And this is something that um, researchers have been doing for many years. So let's say we want to collect accurate information about whether people have performed a certain act. And let's say this act is something like drink driving that people don't want to admit to. Um, and therefore, it's difficult to get reliable statistics around it. So we can do this and also protect an individual's privacy by like, playing the following game. We can give them a coin that we know the um, bias of. And let's just assume for argument's sake, it's a fair coin. Then we send them into the corner and we tell them to apply steps one, two, and three. Um, we don't see the outcome of their coin flips. They just come back to us at the end of this procedure and say yes or no to whether they've committed act X. So precisely, they flip this coin once. If it's tails, they respond truthfully. If it's heads, they flip again and respond yes if it's heads and no if it's tails. If you were to sit and work out what that procedure gives you, you'll quickly realize that we can actually work out accurately the proportion of people who have performed act X. So that allows us to get accurate statistics um, about the population as a whole. Equally, given that any person who flipped these coins, and we didn't see which coins they flipped, um, had a 25% chance of getting two heads and therefore answering yes, regardless of whether they've committed act X or not, we've given any person the ability to just turn around and say, yeah, you know, I got two heads, didn't actually drink drive. So we're giving them a sense of privacy through plausible deniability. The key idea here is that randomization is essential for any privacy guarantee. So with this in mind, we're going to introduce differential privacy. Specifically, we're going to introduce epsilon differential privacy. There is a more relaxed version of differential privacy that exists called epsilon delta differential privacy, but it's, it's easier to introduce epsilon differential privacy. The ideas are identical. So I'm going to introduce the terms on this slide first, and then we're going to walk through an example um, straight after. So data sets D and D prime are essentially the same, apart from one row in D prime has been either added or deleted versus data set D. Epsilon is our privacy loss or privacy budget, depending on how you think of it. This mechanism M, for machine learning, we can think of this as a machine learning model that's been trained with the addition of some differentially private algorithm. So it's had some randomization procedure applied to it. S is just an event or an outcome from our model. So what the left-hand side of this equation is saying is that the probability that I see an outcome S from my model trained on data set D is less than or equal to seeing that same output from my model trained on a different data set D prime, crucially only different by one row. Um, with this factor e to the epsilon. And if epsilon is zero, then the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, and the output of the model doesn't change depending on whether it trained a data set D or D prime. And it's the mechanism M that has introduced randomization. Okay, so like holding that thought in mind, um, we're going to look at an example now. So Let's say we've taken our model and we trained it on data set D, and this is a coral world. Um, and the true answer to a particular query to our model is 100. But we know from previous discussions that we can't answer 100. If we give precise answers out that are true, um, then we're going to leak privacy straight away and leak sensitive information. So we're going to have to add some random noise to this, um, this answer of 100. And that's what the coral distribution is showing you. It defines a distribution of possible answers around the true answer of 100. The gray distribution represents the world in which our model was trained on a data set 
D prime, where one individual was removed from the data set. So now let's say the true answer is 99, but again, we need to release an answer from our data set or our model will return an answer um, from a distribution around that true answer. And that's what the gray distribution is depicting there. If we look along the x-axis and we pick a point, when we um, return an answer from our model, it will be deterministic after the random training procedure has been applied. Let's say we pick a point somewhere on the right of this distribution and we answer 150 um, as the output to our model. The point here is that 150 is a response. The probability of that event occurring is basically the same in the coral world as in the gray world. So the chance that an event occurs with, individu with an individual's data and without their data is essentially the same. And when I'm saying like loosely essentially the same here, that's precisely what the um, e to the epsilon term was given us on the previous slide. So we can quantify this, um, this bounding term exactly. And I also made the point that um, epsilon equals zero would make the left-hand side and the right-hand side equal to each other here. Now we may initially think that's desirable, but that's not actually the case. If the output of our model doesn't change as we remove individuals from our data, then we've essentially learned nothing from our data because we could keep removing individuals one by one until there were no individuals left in our data and our model output hadn't changed. And that would imply we'd learned nothing from our data set. So the model output will change as we remove rows from our data. Differential privacy just bounds precisely by how much this is allowed to happen. And so we've talked a little bit here about um, being imprecise in our answers. So with the coral distribution, we had a true answer of 100, and we may have released any answer from a distribution around that. And that begs a natural question of, you know, how fat should we make these curves, or how inaccurate should we be when we provide a response? And that roughly depends on two things. One, it depends on how sensitive the model's output is to a given individual in the data set. Let's call this term delta. And also like how private we want to be. Let's, this is epsilon. If epsilon's small, that's highly private. So let's again say epsilon 0 0.1. Then the heuristic is that standard deviation of these curves should scale in proportion to delta over epsilon. And we can understand this as follows. If we want to be highly private, i.e. we want a very small epsilon, then delta over epsilon as epsilon tends to zero will blow up as a term. And the standard deviation of these curves will be huge and we'll be, we'll be providing very inaccurate answers to responses, but we'll also be preserving privacy. If we're highly sensitive to a given individual, then delta is large and as a numerator term, then the standard deviation also increases. If epsilon were very large itself, then that would correspond to the peak distribution in the middle where we'd be providing um, low privacy and being very precise in our responses. So that's like a whistle-stop overview of differential privacy as a definition. So I'm going to talk now about some of the formal guarantees that the priv differential privacy gives us. We have the ability to quantify the privacy guarantee exactly for both individuals and groups. If we are epsilon differentially private with respect to an individual, then we are k times epsilon differentially private with respect to a group of size k. It's robust to all future attacks. This is called being immune to post-processing. And it actually applies regardless of the compute power you have. Differential privacy is a definition, but it's programmable. And so different algorithms can implement differential privacy in different ways. But crucially, it's composable, which means we can take the outputs of data sets or models that are differentially private, combine them, and be guaranteed that the output itself will be differentially private. This is going to be crucial when we think about um, the implementation that's commonly used called differentially private stochastic gradient descent, which essentially ensures that with respect to any mini batch in the data, um, we are differentially private, and therefore we're going to be differentially private with respect to the data set as a whole. This is called composability. The fact we can now quantify privacy and do it exactly allows policymakers and wider decision makers who own data to quantify exactly the trade-off between privacy and utility. And as I've already alluded to, like privacy and generalization are aligned goals. Not memorizing or learning specific things from an individual that don't apply to other individuals in the data set will stop you overfitting. 
The differential privacy is also called the gold standard. It's actually going to be used for the 2020 US Census, which is highly exciting. If you want to read uh, more about differential privacy, there's a free online PDF um, by Cynthia Dwork and Aaron Roth um, called the Al Al Algorithmic Foundation of the Differential Privacy. Um, if that's quite formal and definitely assumes like mathematical and computer science um, backgrounds, but if you want to um, get a gentler introduction, then given that differential privacy is actually being used now for the US Census, Cynthia Dwork has provided some YouTube talks online which are very accessible, uh, motivating the intuition and ideas behind differential privacy. So that's differential privacy um, in a nutshell. So let's talk about quickly about how we can combine this um, with generative modeling. I don't have time to introduce generative modeling. I'm going to, in one slide in about 30 seconds, explain what a VAE does. Um, so VAE takes data in, um, has an encoder, which is a neural network, and essentially learns some compressed representation, um, which essentially parameterizes a probability distribution. And then from sampling, and by sampling from this probability distribution and passing it through a decoder whose weights are learned during the training process, we output um, synthetic data at the other side. To combine this with differential privacy um, is through an algorithm called DPSGD, Differentially Private Stochastic Gradient Descent. And we've kind of got a simple slide that introduces this idea here. So we previously talked about this delta term as being the sensitivity of our model's output to a given individual. What DPSGD does, and there's a reference paper there at the bottom, uh, you can see, is clips gradients whilst we're training the neural network to a known norm. This bounds our sensitivity to any individuals within the data. And we know the norm, we fix that norm. We then add noise. The amount of noise that we add will give us a certain privacy guarantee. We want to be more private, we'll have more noise, less private, less noise. And that's what's kind of being depicted in this chart here. We're ignoring here any stochasticity that relates to mini batching. And on the right, we're just showing that at gradient steps, we're kind of noising the gradients. And so we may wander occasionally um, in the wrong direction. But over time, assuming the noise added isn't punitive to the training process, we will still converge. So as an overview, um, this is what faculty's approach to um, private data gives us. We have real data in, we train a differentially private variation autoencoder, and we output either a private synthetic data set or differentially private VAE. And crucially, we have epsilons and deltas surrounding this. Um, so we can have a formal uh, privacy guarantee, um, which allows us to quantify the trade-off between utility and privacy. Um, with that overview in mind, I'm going to hand over now back to Christian to um, talk through some real world results. Right. Thank you, Mark. Um, so just before I get started with the next section, just wanted to quickly call out, there is a Q&A um, button that you can press in Zoom. So if you have questions that arise and um, as we go through the presentation, please put them in there and then we can sort of at the end go through that list and answer them one by one. Cool, onwards and outwards. So now that we have a good understanding of um, differential privacy, let's go to sort of the uh, meat of the talk where we have the nice results of how we actually use this in practice. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so I'm gonna show you one case study. Um, this was a project that faculty did with MRAD. So MRAD is the East Midlands Radiology Consortium. And their problem is that um, so they have breast cancer screening appointments for women. And the problem is that quite often people don't actually show up. So about 30% of people don't show up to their appointments. So this is obviously not great from an operational perspective because it means you have some inefficiencies in terms of you know, staffing and not making sure that resources are used well. So the solution to this sort of problem would be to have a machine learning algorithm that, for example, predicts the likelihood of a no-show appointment. And once you have that, you can then take an intervention for people where you have a low attendance likelihood. 
So this could be sending them a text message or actually giving them a call to make sure they actually show up. So that's the idea in terms of the business problem. However, this data obviously contains highly sensitive information and as such should never really leave the sort of secure MRAD environment. So the question is, how do we approach this in this case? Next slide, please. Right, and our solution to this was to have a machine learning model that is trained on the synthetic data and then deployed on the real data. So let's go for this diagram step by step. So here we have sort of two sections. On the left, we have the MRAD environment. So these are, imagine a computer sitting somewhere in, in MRAD. And then on the right, we have the faculty environment. Imagine a faculty computer. And in between, we have this sort of line, which I call privacy moat. And this sort of means that any sensitive data should never really cross this line. So we really have a good separation between the MRAD and the faculty environment. OK, so how does this then work? So if we start at the top left, you can see we have some real historic appointment data. So this means we have appointment data that sort of shows us um, previously if people showed up or not. So some features and an outcome. What we then do is we take our sort of synthetic data generator, or private synthetic data generator, and train this on this real historic data. So this happens all inside the MRED environment. Once we have trained this model, we can use it to generate a bunch of private synthetic data. And that, by definition, is then safe to leave the MRED environment. So we go across the mode and we have private synthetic appointment data. Now we're in faculty environment, and that means we can just use this data um, to our behest and just um, train a machine learning model to try to predict the appointment status entirely on the synthetic data. Once we're reasonably happy with that, we sort of validated our model well enough, we can actually say, okay, this model seems to work well, let's try to actually get it back into the MRAP environment. So this means we cross the privacy mode again, this time from the other side, and we just take our model and start deploying it in the MRAP environment. Now this means we have a model in the MRAD environment. And what we can do is we can take the real data again. So this could be current appointment data that's coming in right now. And then based on that, we can feed that into the model and get a likelihood of attending the appointment out. So this is sort of the way we approach this problem. And this provides us a way to uh, make sure that the sensitive data never leaves a secure environment. It's probably worth pointing out that other approaches do exist. So you could also imagine something like a federated learning approach. But the reason this is quite nice is that it's quite a, a low cost way because all you have to do is you have to make sure that the synthetic data generation happens on a synthetic side. And then once you make the synthetic data, you can do everything you want in sort of your own environment. So in terms of computational infrastructure, it's quite uh, scalable in that sense. Uh, next slide, please. Right, and here we have some actual data. So what I'm going to show you now is a bunch of univariate comparison between real data and synthetic data that sort of broadly assess the quality of the private synthetic data. And here you can see a few histograms of numeric data. So on the y-axis for all of these plots, we have the count. So this is the number of people in the data set. And on the x-axis, we have three different numeric features. We have a booking date time. So this is like a timestamp feature, a screening appointment number. So this would be like appointment one, two, three. So a discrete feature. And then also we have time since previous screening. So this would be in days. Uh, one key thing to note here is that this is not actually real data, the real data. The real data in this case is a toy data set that has similar properties to the actual MRAP data. So this is more sort of showing if you have this type of data, you can do this sort of thing. And as you can see, the histograms here in red, we always have the real data and in gray, the synthetic data. And broadly on all of these three plots, we see that they overlap quite well. So we can see like the peak falls in the same range and we can even capture um, properties that seem a little bit more difficult. So for example, on the plot on the right, you see we have this sort of almost bimodal distribution where we have a peak at zero and then another sort of Gaussian feature at higher values. 
So even that we can capture with our method quite well. Just to be absolutely clear about it, because some people have been getting confused with these plots. So the red and gray are the real and synthetic data. And whenever this sort of dark red color is, that means the two distributions actually overlap. So just to make that clear. Cool. Uh, next slide, please. Right, here we have some more features. So I showed you some numeric features. Now we can also look at some other types of features. Here on the left, we have categorical data. And on the right, we have binary data. So for the categorical data, we have something like the practice postcodes, which has some like 80 values in there. And same story as with the previously with the numeric data, we can see there's quite a high overlap between real and synthetic data which gives us confidence that um, our synthetic data has good quality. Then a similar conclusion can be reached on the right with the binary data, where you see in this case, it's really spot on in terms of the distributions. Like you can not even see any difference between the real synthetic data in terms of these, these proportions. So this is a univariate assessment of the data, which tells us that on sort of a column by column level, the synthetic data looks quite good. So if you go to the next slide, we can also look at bivariate association in the data. And for this, what we've done is to compute the correlation coefficients between the features. So here we have Spearman correlations in the real data and synthetic data. And this sort of tells you how much does one feature depend on another feature. So if they're highly associated, if they're perfectly correlated, it's one, if they're perfectly inversely correlated, it's minus one. If they don't depend on each other at all in terms of Spearman correlation, then it would be zero. So this gives you some sort of indication of feature interactions on a, a bivariate level. And as you can see, again, we're doing fairly well in terms of reproducing what we see in the real data. So in the sort of these numbers always tell you the correlation coefficient and the colors indicate the value as well. So just by looking at the colors, you can see that looks quite similar. And based on that, um, we have a good reproduction of these correlation coefficients in the synthetic data. We can also look at specific examples. So for example, if you look at the, I don't know, booking date separation and booking date time, we have in the real data, we get minus 0.66. And in the synthetic data, we get minus 0.65. So this seems super close. And same thing happens if we look at something that's less strong in terms of the correlation. So if you look at correlation between, I don't know, appointment status and screening appointment number, we have minus 0.04 in the real data, and minus 0.08 in the synthetic data. So you see that the same trends are definitely captured in the synthetic data, even though it's not perfect in terms of the actual numbers. So this means that the data obviously has the same trends, but it's not a one-to-one -one mapping really because it is ultimately a synthetic data set that will differ a little bit. So these capture to some extent univariate and bivariate distributions of the data. What's important to note is that that's obviously not everything that's going on. You could have much more complex dependencies in your data. And these are generally quite hard to tease out with these sort of simple statistical exercises. So as I was saying earlier, the best test of this data will, of course, come from actually training a machine learning model on it and then seeing how it performs, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so what I also wanted to show you is we can actually compare um, directly rows in the real and the synthetic data. So here you can see a uh, table of one row in the real data. So on the vertical axis, we have all the features in the data set. So they go down and compared to that, we have the row in the synthetic data. And here the row in the synthetic data is actually the closest match. And closest match here means that we use the Gower distance um, to find um, from all the rows in the synthetic data was the closest one. It's almost like a nearest neighbor I can find in the real data. So here what you can see is that for quite a lot of features, for example, the categorical features, we actually get exactly the same um, value. For example, practice postcode, smart clinic, we have identical values in real and synthetic data. And that to some extent is a byproduct that you don't have that many choices 
in terms of the values for categorical features. But if you look at some numeric features like uh, time since previous screening, or what else do we have? Previous screening dates, you can see that clearly differ. Time since previous screening is like 100 days apart, or maybe screening appointment number is 20 versus 11 in the synthetic data. So you can see that there are clear differences, and this is the closest match in the synthetic data. But despite that, it's not really the same. So it's sort of different in subtle ways. But overall, it might still, once you're embedded in a sort of larger set of data, it will still look similar on that perspective. Cool. And I think we can go to the next slide. Right, so this is the final slide on results. And this is sort of the key plot that we want you to take home with. Um, and the headline result is that the higher privacy of synthetic data leads to lower model utility in deployment. Or stated the other way around, if you want um, a high model utility, you can't have also super high privacy. So it speaks to the heart that there's always this trade-off between the amount of privacy and synthetic data. Okay, so what do we actually look at in this plot? So here on the y-axis, I show you the performance of the model. And just to remind you, here this means the machine learning model was trained on the synthetic data and then tested on a set of real holdout data. So this means we held back some real data at the beginning and only used it at the very end to test the machine learning model that was trained on synthetic data. And utility here, we use this to measure the uh, area under the rock curve. So 0.5 means the model is essentially randomly guessing. And then the best possible utility of the model you can have is 0.8 in this case, which is a model trained on the real data directly. And as you can see in red line, we have the different synthetic data sets and the associated model utility. And as we have the very highest privacy, so epsilon around 0 0.1 or so, we actually create synthetic data that's practically useless for this sort of classification task. But as we reduce the amount of privacy and get to epsilon around one, we can see we actually gain a useful data set and a useful model. And we get, get, get an area under the rock curve of around 0.7 or so. And you might say this doesn't look amazing because in the real data I get 0.8, but it really sort of depends on your application. 0.7 could be great in terms of getting a model deployed and having something that actually works a lot better than what the current system is. And also to emphasize that here, really, the optimal choice depends on your needs. So maybe for some use cases, you don't have that stringent constraints on privacy. So we can go to higher epsilon values and then get better models. But maybe for other cases, that's not possible. And a really high privacy means we have to make some trade-off in terms of the model performance. Right. And with that, I think we can go to the conclusion. So conclusion, I've got three points here. First thing is making AI real requires safe ways to utilize data sets that contain sensitive information. So we firmly believe that there's loads of data out there that has sensitive information, but that is sort of locked up in organizations um, all over the world, which should not be used as it is and should not be used in an anonymized form. So we think that technology here can really make a difference in order to get to somewhere we can unlock the value of the data sets. And in particular, we think that this sort of approach of differential private synthetic data can unlock the value of these data sets without really compromising privacy. And we believe that this sort of approach will is sort of simple and generalizes to many domains and data sets. And by that regard, hopefully it will enable AI adoption in many areas where privacy is really paramount. And I think this is the end of the talk. Yes, it is. So now the fun starts, the Q&A section. Um, I notice we have quite a lot of questions um, here that we can go through. How do we do this, Mark? Uh, I can't see them, so you'll have to just shout them out, I think. OK, shall I just? Um, uh, 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 uh. So, 
I'm gonna message you all the questions so we can sort of make sure we answer everything in a sort of uh, systematic way. And then bear with us, this will definitely be worth it. Um, yeah, also feel free to answer more questions as we go along, if you have any more um, burning desire for more information. So I've got a couple of questions here. One, someone's asking if probability of one data set is zero or the outcomes of a model trained in one data set is zero and on the other data set is one. That's a big change. Um, that's bad. The point is precisely that it's the e to the epsilon term that bounds how much that's allowed to happen. So um, it won't be allowed to happen that you could have for a given epsilon such a large change. If epsilon small, you'll be limited in how much that ratio can change. There's also a question around like, what are the downsides of differential privacy compared to other privacy approaches? And definitely um, one of the downsides is that um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a formal and complicated scientific um, definition from computer science and developing algorithms that can scale wasn't done until very recently. So this differentially private stochastic gradient descent um, is only, um, has only been around in the last few years. And also training this for data sets at scale um, wasn't possible until, until recently. Um, also when you're adding noise, like you are harming the learning process to some extent. So differential privacy is not a realm of small data sets. You do need quite a large amount of data. And also like, Differential privacy tends to work well when you can process the whole data set in one go. So if you've got data coming in, um, it's more complicated to um, perform differential privacy then because every time you're um, doing this, you're having to like, compose the steps, keep track of your epsilon and deltas to know what your current privacy budget is. And that like accounting of the privacy um, budget can get quite complicated. And so it definitely is better to process the whole data set in one go. Hope that answers the questions. Um. Cool. I can also answer a question. So there's one question on will the slides be given? And I've been told yes, the slides will be given. They will be shared to all attendees and posted on our YouTube channel. So that's good. Um, there's a question here about why was it easier to train a VAE in a secure environment? Um, than just train a predictive model in the environment in the first place? And then that's a fantastic question. Um, so you can train differentially private classifiers. You could even just train a classifier directly in their environment. The real benefit of training a differentially private um, variational autoencoder is you can then give copies of that data set to your own data scientist. So let's say you're in an organization where everyone internally can't access the data set um, without some, you know, clearance. You can then take a differentially private VAE train, um, train on the sensitive data and either give that model then to your data scientist or to staff, give the data to staff who can then perform analysis on that data set. That's like a general purpose um, use case versus like a classifier, which is just, you know, very task specific. Yeah, maybe just to add to this, um, even if you were in a position in, in your organization and you can do everything yourself, there's still, you know, you might still want to consider having a mechanism whereby you allow other parts, other organization, maybe even to help you in terms of this is sort of a data set that I really want to work with, I'm struggling with. I want to see what are the best possible methods out there. So it's just, it really enables quite a lot because it means that you know, access to this data set will be so much easier than when it's, um, when it's heavily regulated. Cool. I notice we have another question. Maybe we should actually, yeah. So the question is, is there an ethical trade-off between privacy and utility for high-risk situations, e.g. medical models where increasing privacy may lead to worse predictions. How do people approach this trade-off in practice? Um, 
I'll have a stab maybe on a jumping question. I mean, this this trade-off exists for the whole of machine learning, right? Um, I don't think anyone here is advocating that machine learning models should be deployed into um, situations where they're used for critical decision making um, without humans in the loop. Um, and so like proper model validation is always a crucial part of that process. Um, and the fact that a model is slightly worse um, because it's made private, you know, as Christian has alluded to, there may be situations where it's no model giving you no utility. Um, having a private model, which has some utility is actually beneficial, particularly if that can be combined with, with other humans in the process. So I don't think there's an easy answer to that. And it's clearly going to be something that's determined, uh, you know, both, both from legal aspects um, and from the use case um, for the companies and decision makers involved. Christian, do you have anything you want to? Um, I think, yeah, I think I agree with everything in your answer. One thing I would add is this, this is already quite new stuff still, and not a lot of people, um, I think, are actually even doing this or thinking about doing this. So even in something like the US Census, there are discussions in terms of what should the epsilon be. So I think we we'll probably still have to be a little bit of, still to be a little bit of work in terms of to come up with guidelines in, terms of in which situation is what is applicable. And, um, yeah, obviously it will depend from situation to situation. And, but hopefully as we go along and as we sort of uh, maybe even have like these privacy attacks on models where you can actually show that uh, uh, whether a model leaks information or not, those sort of techniques will be helpful in terms of really assessing for this type of model. I have this sort of danger. That's why I choose this absolute value. Okay, there's a question asking, um, is any classifier trained on differentially private synthetic data automatically differentially private? Uh, the answer to this is yes. Um, this is a composability um, point, which is that if you take any function and perform it on differentially private um, data or outputs, then you're automatically differentially private. So that's a yes to that question. Uh, we have more questions. So, oh, maybe I'll let you take the VAE one. Um, I'll, I was just going to read it. Um, uh, maybe then I'll decide whether I'll take it or not. Um, with the VAE in, in the secure environment, why would you use that VAE to generate synthetic data examples versus just passing the embeddings from the real data over to the other environment for modeling on latent data? Um, Right, do I understand this? Well, I'm not sure if, if the person's meaning will the latent space respect privacy? And I think the answer to that would be no. Um, well, unless it was differentially private, um, differentially privately trained. Um, I mean, I guess we could pass a latent space over and work with that, but ultimately we do want to build a machine learning model that's probably interpretable um, to the people. So at inference time, they can pass the real data in and the classifier itself was trained on on the real, um, you know, structure of the data with the correct columns, etc. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So this is the embeddings from the real data over to the other environment. Yeah, I think the key point is if you have embeddings on real data in a non-private way, you know, that's non-private. But if you do it for synthetic data, yes, in theory, that's like essentially saying you pass your VAE over to the real environment, which in a way poses a little bit more risk because then you actually have access to the data generating mechanism. So by just giving you the synthetic data that comes out, you sort of limit the amount of information you can squeeze out of the model. So it provides you actually a higher guarantee of privacy in this case. Yeah, so on that point, it should be noted that the synthetic data from a variational autoencoder is more private than the VAE itself because it represents a finite, a finite amount of samples from the VAE. Obviously, VAE can just keep sampling um, forever, basically. Um, there's a question around, is there a standard epsilon per industry or problem type? Um, no, is a short answer. It will be very interesting to see what the US um, census 
thinks is a sensible answer to this question. Um, there is a theoretical value of epsilon, which is basically log two. Um, and if you don't get an epsilon below log two, then in theory, someone could have um, still some chance of um, in the future being able to extract something from your um, from your data. It should be pointed out that from experiments we've conducted, you can take state-of-the-art machine learning attacks from research, um, conduct those on data sets and models, and even for epsilon values that are significantly higher, so we're talking in the hundreds here, um, you can basically thwart current machine learning attacks. And so obviously not having an epsilon below log two uh, means that in the future someone could be smarter and design a better attack or they could have more compute power and you're not going to be safe unless your epsilon is below log two. But very high epsilon values at the moment um, do guard against um, state-of-the-art attacks at present. Cool. I think that's answered. So we have a bunch more questions and we have one minute left. So how do we approach this? Um, maybe pick one more question to answer. So the answer to the question on is the latent space guaranteed to be differentially private, even if the VAE was trained with DPSGD. Um, if the latent space is output from the variational autoencoder, it will also be differentially private. And I think it's important to note that anyone who's asked a question and we haven't had a chance to respond to, um, we will be able to follow up with you afterwards um, and email you responses to your questions. So I apologize, we haven't had a chance to, to answer everyone. I don't know if Kristen, you want to squeeze any more in before we finish. So I can see one question on how to make synthetic data. I think we're not going to be able to squeeze that in. Um, yeah, I think other than that, we've covered everything. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a few more questions now, but I don't think we're going to have time to um, to respond to them. So. Okay. So let's leave the remaining ones by email. And um, yeah, I think that's everything from us then. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Great, thank you. Hope you enjoyed this. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.